Hey everyone, welcome to Mythology Explained. In today's video, we are going to discuss Set, the Egyptian god of foreign lands, the desert, disasters, strength, storms, protective power, cunning, violence, war, confusion, and chaos. Chaos being something he both embodied and combated. He was invoked by pharaohs and warriors so as to emulate him in battle and channel his strength. He murdered Osiris, the king of the gods, and usurped the throne, later vying with his nephew Horus, the rightful king, in a decades-long struggle for supremacy. And he was the sun god's greatest protector, journeying with Ra each night through the underworld, fighting and felling, on a nightly basis, the terrible serpent Apophis, the personification of chaos, thus ensuring the sun prevailed over the perils of the thonic depths and survived to rise again each morning and bathe the world in life-giving light. All right, let's get into it. In ancient Egyptian iconography, Set, also spelled Seth, is depicted in a unique and unmistakable manner. Unlike many Egyptian deities whose appearances are recognizable from the natural world, Set's appearance, either zoomorphic, full animal, or partly zoomorphic and partly anthropomorphic, human-animal hybrid, is based on an animal, usually referred to as the set animal, that doesn't correspond to any creature that actually exists. It is a composite creature with a curved snout, squared off ears, and a forked tail. Some suggest it might be an amalgamation, possibly including elements of aardvarks, donkeys, jackals, and fennec foxes. Others have proposed more fantastical creatures like the griffin. Furthermore, while other features can be conceivably connected to other animals, the forked, tapering tail doesn't clearly match any known animal, adding even more to the mystery of Set's iconography. He is often shown as this creature, or as a man with the head of this creature. In terms of color, Set is often painted red, a color that has dual connotations in ancient Egyptian culture. It could be associated with chaos, storms, and the desert, elements that Set is the god of, but also with vitality and protection. His coloring, what it signifies, marks him as a deity of ambiguity, embodying both the power of disorder and the necessary force to quell that disorder. Egyptian mythology has many demiurges, creator gods, and cosmogonies, accounts of how the universe came into being, meaning there's many versions of the creation myth, different versions espoused by different cities and religious centers at different times. The version most germane to this video is that of the Heliopolitan Enyed, a group of nine gods who are particularly preeminent in Heliopolis. Heliopolis, meaning City of the Sun, was a significant ancient Egyptian city, so named by the Greeks because it was renowned for its worship of the sun god Ra. The word Enyed is also a Greek word, meaning nine, so the Enyed of Heliopolis basically means the nine most important gods in the city of Heliopolis. The nine gods of the Heliopolitan Enyed are 1. Atum, the creator god and the head of the Enyed 2. Shu, the personification of air 3. Tefnut, the personification of moisture 4. Geb, the personification of the earth 5. Nut, the personification of the sky 6. Osiris, the god of the afterlife, rebirth, and fertility 7. Isis, the goddess of magic, motherhood, and wisdom 8. Set, the god of chaos, storms, and the desert. 9. Nephthys, the goddess associated with death, mourning, and protection. These nine gods didn't come into existence all at the same time, but in a sequence comprising four generations. First, there was a tomb, self-engendered, the god who created himself in the primordial waters of chaos. Second, a tomb, through parthenogenesis, meaning independent procreation, produced Shu, air, and Tefnut, moisture. Third, Shu and Tefnut came together, and born to them were Geb, the earth, and Nut, the sky. And fourth, Geb and Nut came together, and born to them were the final four gods of the Enyed, Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys, two divine brother-sister pairs. Osiris and Isis joined in marriage, and Set and Nephthys joined in marriage. Though Set was incorporated into the Heliopolitan Enyed, 
evidence of him existing as a god is much older than this particular grouping of gods. Which takes us to one of the most important things to understand about Egyptian mythology, the scope of it. The Egyptian empire endured for thousands of years over a large geographic area, its strength waxing and waning throughout, vacillating between times of dominance and times of occupation and subjugation. As you can imagine, 3,000 years bears witness to a lot of change. New gods emerging, old gods fading to irrelevance, power and prominence rising and falling like the annual inundation and recession of the Nile, provinces and purviews shifting like the very sands that sprawl over Egypt, like an unending, undulating sea of silica. Because of this, Egyptian gods are often especially complex figures, who they were 5,000 years ago often being very different from who they were 4,000, 3,000, or 2,000 years ago, cults subsiding, superseding, and subsuming. Set is a salient example of this, and asking who Set was requires contextualization because the answer to that question changed significantly over millennia. Pertaining to Set, we see a transition from veneration to vilification. Set was originally a god of the desert, associated with disturbance and disharmony, and in this capacity he is attested to from the very beginning of ancient Egyptian history, even as far back as pre-dynastic Egypt, which began about 8,000 years ago in 6,000 BC and ended about 5,100 years ago in 3,100 BC. The end of the pre-dynastic period is when the early dynastic period began, and the beginning of the early dynastic period is marked by the advent of the Pharaonic Age and the first unification of Upper and Lower Egypt, meaning Set, his mythology, is older than the era of pharaohs ruling Egypt and is older than the pyramids, most of which weren't built until the time of the Old Kingdom a period spanning roughly from 2686 BC to 2181 BC. The ancientness of Set's cult is evidenced by, among other things, an ivory artifact carved in Set's likeness that dates back to some time between 4000 BC and 3500 BC. By the time of the Middle Kingdom, roughly 2055 BC to 1650 BC, Set's eminence had declined, largely absorbed into the mythology of the sun god, on whose bark Set was now commonly depicted as a defender, battling the chaos serpent Apophis each night in the underworld, something we'll elaborate on later in the video. The Hyksos period, also known as the Second Intermediate Period in ancient Egyptian history, spanned approximately from 1650 BC to 1550 BC. During this phase, Egypt witnessed the rise of the Hyksos, a group of foreign rulers believed to have originated from the Levant. The Hyksos seized control over parts of Egypt. Their domination introduced significant cultural and political changes in the region. The Hyksos brought new military technology, such as the horse-drawn chariot and composite bows, which proved instrumental in their military successes. They ruled as pharaohs and were open to incorporating Egyptian religious beliefs into their own pantheon. Set, whom the Hyksos identified with their own god Baal, gained prominence within their religious system. Eventually, the Egyptians from Thebes and other southern regions led a revolt against the Hyksos, leading to their eventual expulsion from Egypt and the establishment of the New Kingdom. The Hyksos period marked a unique chapter in Egyptian history characterized by foreign influence, military innovations, and religious syncretism. As time went on, Set's reputation became more repugnant and his importance more inimical. As the god of the desert and of foreign lands, Set was associated with Egypt's rivals, a fact that became drastically more damaging to how he was perceived when domestic power dwindled and foreign power surged. This later leading to his association with the Assyrians, Egypt's hated enemies. All worship of Set seems to have more or less ceased by the 25th dynasty, spanning approximately from 744 BC to 656 BC. However, worship and perceived power aren't to be conflated here. Though Set no longer basked in the worship of the Egyptians, as did his pantheon peers, he was still viewed as a god of great power 
Only now, rituals relevant to him usually repelled rather than invoked. Apotropaic rites, meaning rites that ward off evil, were used to foil him, frustrate his evil, and fend off his bad luck. Though Set's dominance declined over time, he remained an ambiguous deity, hurtful and helpful, embodying chaos and combating chaos, which is why, on the one hand, his strength and protection was sought, while, on the other, Set's birthday was considered an inauspicious day, wax figurines of Set were made and destroyed to ward off his evil, and there's evidence of a ritualistic royal hippo hunt in which the pharaoh hunted and killed a wild hippo. The hippo, an animal associated with Set, and the killing of the hippo, thus symbolic of Horus' victory over Set, affirming the legitimacy of the rightful king, which the pharaoh became when kingship, in terms of the mythological narrative, transitioned from the time of direct rule by the gods to the rule of mortal man. As well, Set was eventually made the murderer of Osiris and the usurper of the divine throne. One thought here is that because Osiris was the god of the underworld, the underworld being the domain of the dead, this gradually gave rise to a presupposing myth in which Osiris was killed, precipitating his transcendence from life to death, and that, once this myth took root, Set was, given his escalating vilification, the natural choice to serve as the culprit and catalyst. The murder of Osiris is something we'll cover at length later on in the video. Now to give a general idea of who Set was, his power and purview, here's a passage from the complete Gods and Goddesses of Ancient Egypt. Set was the Red One, the ill-tempered god who personified anger, rage, and violence, and who was often regarded as evil personified. As the god of chaos, he opposed the harmony of Mat, truth, and was a veritable dark side to the fabric of the universe. As a god of the desert, or red land, he opposed and threatened the vegetation upon which life itself depended. And as the inimical foe of Osiris, rightful king of Egypt, he represented rebellion and strife. In Egyptian writing, the set animal was used as the determinative sign for many words connoting confusion and chaos at the personal, social, and cosmic levels. His malevolent character was thought to be expressed in this world also, in all kinds of problems and crimes, in sickness and disease, as well as civil unrest and foreign invasion. He was associated with storms and bad weather of all types, and was also thought to be the god of the wide, raging sea. Mythologically, he could be identified with other malignant Egyptian deities, including the great chaos serpent Apophis. And he was identified by the Greeks with their own rebellious god Typhon. The character of Set was not entirely inimical, however, as he was also held to be cunning and of great strength, and these qualities could be put to good use. One of his most common epithets was great of strength, and his scepter was said to weigh the equivalent of some 4,500 pounds. He was the lord of metals. Iron, the hardest metal known to the Egyptians, was called the bones of Set. In the pyramid texts, it is the strength of Set that the deceased pharaoh claims and many living kings liken themselves to him. Thus, although Set could be identified with the chaos serpent Apophis, he was also the sun god's defender against the same monster. The death of Osiris is an event of incredible importance in Egyptian mythology and is probably the event that Set, the murderer of Osiris, is best known for. However, it remains a somewhat obscure myth in that information is sparse, fragmentary, and disparate meaning that, while many sources do provide information, the information is often scant and contradictory. It isn't until much later that we get more detailed accounts of Osiris' death, these penned by Greek writers who equate Set with Typhon, Typhon being the most powerful monster in Greek mythology, and a threat so dire that he shook the very foundation of Olympus. Set's supposed motives for killing his brother are many, including taking revenge for a kick Osiris gave him, taking revenge for Osiris betting Nephthys, Set's wife, and Set self-aggrandizing, tired of always playing second fiddle to his older brother, jealous of his power and prominence, and so dedicating himself to devious and drastic action to depose the man whose shadow he ever lived under, to which end murder was found to be the tool of choice. As for how Set did away with his brother, the means are as varied as his motives, including dismembering, drowning, and trampling, 
this last after taking the form of a wild animal. In Egyptian sources, the murder of Osiris transpires somewhere remote, somewhere in the wilderness where no witnesses are present. This changes, though, with the more complete accounts of later classical writers, like Diodorus Siculus and Plutarch, both of them prolific Greek historians, both of them making the death of Osiris a public assassination instead of a secluded slaying. According to Diodorus Siculus, Set dismembered Osiris' body and distributed it among his followers, all 26 bloody pieces. According to Plutarch, Set used his cunning to ascertain the exact dimensions of Osiris' body, then using this information to craft a beautiful and bespoke chest. Set unveiled it at a feast and promised to give it to whoever fit inside perfectly, masking his malevolent machination in the guise of a game. All 72 of Set's followers tried, enhancing the spectacle and adding depth to the deception. And of course, when Osiris went to try, he fit flawlessly, as if the chest was made to suit his exact dimensions, which it was. And the moment he lay down, the trap was sprung. The conspirators slammed down the lid of the chest, nailed it shut, and sealed it with molten lead, proceeding to throw it in the Nile, where it was carried out to sea. Isis, who was absent from the feast, later learned of the odious occurrence that had come to pass. She recovered the chest and returned to Egypt, but Set wasn't one to wait idly and watch while his work was undone. He found out where Isis was keeping the body and he mutilated it. He butchered it into 14 pieces and scattered them across the land of Egypt. As before, Isis once again recovered the body, but where previously this entailed finding a chest containing a corpse intact, free of mangle and maim, this time she had to scour at the sands of Egypt. In accomplishing this macabre mission, Isis is often described as being helped by her sister Nephthys, both of them transforming into birds, soaring swiftly to cover more ground. In Plutarch's telling, Isis buried each piece when she found it. In another version, Isis, once she had recovered all the pieces of her hued husband, was able to restore Osiris, and at some point, Anubis' own mythology became interwoven into this whole affair, incorporated into the death and resurrection of Osiris. He was described as defending the body against numerous attempts by the followers of Set to further despoil it. This in keeping with one of Anubis' chief roles, the guardian of burial grounds. And he was even described as having a direct role in the resurrection of Osiris, a transformation facilitated by Isis and Anubis working in concert. Isis using her magical mastery, and Anubis using the arts of embalming and mummification. As well, in like manner to the savage safeguarding of Anubis, the magic of Thoth was also said to have been integral to the protection and preservation of Osiris's body. Osiris was resurrected, an ephemeral event, for this didn't herald a permanent return to the land of the living, only affording enough time for a transient tryst. Osiris and Isis coming together in a night of passion, the result of which was Isis becoming pregnant with Horus, the son destined to be king, the rightful king destined to right the wrongs of his uncle and bring about a return to order. While Osiris not making a lasting return to the land of the living was ostensibly a great loss, his return to the underworld was actually a cause for joy and jubilation, for Osiris' transcendence was a gift rather than a curse an augmentation rather than a diminishment. As the king of the underworld, Osiris became far greater than he was as the king of the living world. And herein lies an important point. Set, though he was an agent of chaos, often inadvertently engendered good outcomes. The best example of this being the death of Osiris. Very bad on the surface, but actually very good ultimately. What this is emblematic of is the delicate balance between chaos and order, between Isfet and Mat. Yes, if you wanted to reductively categorize them, you could say Isfet is bad and Mat is good. But the ancient Egyptian conceptualization of universal harmony wasn't so simplistic, for they were both necessary, the good complementing the bad and vice versa. The perfection that was the continuation of creation built atop a two-pillar foundation a pillar of chaos and a pillar of order. Either one completely overcoming the other would result in the end of creation, which, if this happened, would unravel 
and reassimilate into the waters of chaos, the ultimate source and destination of everything. This dynamic of order and chaos existing in conflict-ridden harmony is demonstrated in Ra's nightly battle with Apophis in the underworld. Ra always wins, but Apophis is never put to a permanent end, showing the need to constrain rather than kill chaos, which would be catastrophic and would condemn creation to oblivion. The contendings of Horus and Set, an ancient Egyptian text dating from the New Kingdom period, 1550 to 1070 BC, is one of the most significant and complex stories from ancient Egyptian mythology, recounting a protracted legal battle between Horus and Set for the throne of Egypt following the death of Osiris. Osiris, the former king of Egypt, was, as discussed at length, murdered by his brother Set, who then usurped the throne. Osiris' son, Horus, seeking to claim his rightful place as king and avenge his father's death, challenged Set's rule. The gods, acting as a divine court, were divided over whom to support. Set, the current king, was powerful and had his supporters, and Horus, the legitimate heir, had his own advocates, including the goddess Isis, his mother. The trials included physical contests and cunning trickery between Set and Horus, such as the transformation into hippopotami for a battle of strength and endurance and a boat race with stone ships. The dispute lasted for 80 years until the gods finally ruled in favor of Horus, citing his legitimate right to the throne and his ultimate moral and physical victory over Set. Set was forced to relinquish the throne and Horus assumed his place as the ruler of Egypt. Despite the intense conflict, Set was not completely vilified, reflecting the complex nature of the gods in Egyptian mythology. The tale essentially serves as a mythical precedent for the historical practice of Egyptian kingship, emphasizing legitimacy and moral righteousness. Here's the passage from the contendings of Horus and Set that describes one of the challenges the two gods competed in. Set, being angry, let out a loud cry before the face of the Enyad, saying, Is the office being awarded to my young brother, even while I, who am his elder brother, am still about? Then he took an oath as follows. The white crown shall be removed from the head of Horus, son of Isis, and he shall be thrown into the water, so that I can contend with him for the office of ruler. Ra acquiesced. Thereupon Set said to Horus, Come, let's both transform ourselves into hippopotamuses and submerge in the deep waters in the midst of the sea. Now as for the one who shall emerge within the span of three whole months, the office shall not be awarded to him. Then they both submerged, and so Isis sat down and wept, saying, Set has killed Horus, my son. Then she fetched a spool of yarn. She fashioned a line, took a Deben's weight worth of copper, cast it into a harpoon, tied the line to it, and hurled it into the water at the spot where Horus and Set had submerged. Then the bar bit into the body of her son Horus. So Horus let out a loud cry, saying, Help me, Mother Isis, my mother. Appeal to your barb to let go of me. I am Horus, son of Isis. Thereupon Isis let out a loud cry and told her barb, Let go of him. See, that's my son Horus, my child. So her barb let go of him. Then she hurled it back again into the water, and it bit into the body of Set. So Set let out a loud cry, saying, What have I done against you, my sister Isis? Appeal to your barb to let go of me. I am your maternal brother, Isis. And she felt compassionate toward him. Thereupon Set called to her, saying, Do you love this stranger even more than your maternal brother, Set? So Isis appealed to her barb, saying, Let go of him, see? It's Isis's maternal brother whom you have bitten into. Then the barb let go of him. Horus viewed his mother's compassion as a betrayal, and he met betrayal with brutality, using a weighty cleaver to lop off Isis's head. Following the decapitation, Horus retreated into the mountains, and upon learning of what happened, Ra, who was astounded and infuriated, sent the whole might of the Enyad in pursuit instructing them to hunt down the renegade son and to inflict severe punishment upon his capture. It was Set who found Horus, descending upon him while he reposed beneath the canopy of an oasis. With surprise on his side, Set quickly got the better of his quarry, overpowering him and gouging out his eyes. 
he left Horus, blind and beaten, and made his way back to the other gods, reporting, after he had rejoined them, that his search was fruitless, finding no one. Fortunately for Horus, serendipity would follow savagery, for he, a forlorn fugitive, was later found by Hathor, who milked a gazelle and used the milk to treat Horus's bleeding sockets, bidding Horus open his eyes and fill the sightless holes with milk. Horus did as instructed, and soon after his eyes were healed. Hathor returned to the other gods and apprised them of Set's attack. The gods then summoned Horus and Set to be judged. What followed was a period of false peace, yet more challenges, Horus and Set jousting and jostling for supremacy, and finally, the defeat of Set and the triumph of Horus. Set was brought before the court in chains, and he conceded the kingship, proclaiming that Horus should inherit the throne of his father. Despite his defeat, Set's fate had yet to be decided. Banishment or imprisonment certainly would have been fair given the severity of his crimes, which were egregious in degree and interminable in length. But he was put to use, his strength second to none, instead of being made an example of. Ra spoke up and asked that Set be given into his service. This is segue into the final segment of this video, which delves into Set's life post-defeat, him becoming a bulwark on the sun god Solar Bark, a perennial protector, one of, if not the, main powers that ensured Ra survived his nightly voyage through the underworld. And to explain Ra's nightly journey through the underworld, the crux of which was the nightly clash with Apophis, and to explain Set's involvement, here is a passage from Egyptian mythology, a guide to the gods, goddesses, and traditions of ancient Egypt. In Egyptian accounts of the nightly journey of the sun through the underworld, Apophis usually attacks in the seventh and the twelfth hours of the night. Powerful deities stand in the prow of the solar bark to protect the sun god against Apophis. Set, the strongest of the gods, can be shown clubbing or spearing the Apophis snake. The fight between Set and Apophis has sometimes been interpreted as a myth to explain thunderstorms. Another myth, of which no detailed version survives, tells of how the great tomcat, a form of Ra, cut off the head of Apophis under the sacred tree on the night of making war and driving off the rebels. The spirits of the dead were expected to join in the struggle against Apophis, and rituals were performed in temples to ensure his defeat. In the Book of Overthrowing Apophis, the most terrifying deities in the Egyptian pantheon were evoked to combat the Chaos Serpent and destroy all the aspects of his being, such as his body, his name, his shadow, and his magic. Priests acted out this unending war by drawing pictures or making models of Apophis. These were cursed and then destroyed by stabbing, trampling, and burning. And that's it for this video. If you enjoy the content, please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.